As a programmer, I like putting things together into useful or fun things. Sometimes, it's both. The ability to code something that helps me solve a problem is a very powerful and liberating feeling. However, there are times that a software solution is just not enough. Sometimes, I might need something to mount the whiteboard on the wall, or I thought, wouldn't it be a good idea if I could have an extra shelf under my desk to stash away my laptop when I don't need it? Sure, there might be something I can buy to fix that, but sometimes off-the-shelf products just won't cut it. What if there's a tool that can allow me to build things physically? This is where I thought of a 3D printer would help. But that means that I'll need to learn how to do 3D modeling, and I'm not really fond of 3D modeling software. Is there a tool to create 3D models through something that is more in my element? Can I use Python? These are some of the things that I thought about as I delve deeper into the rabbit hole of 3D printing, 3D modeling, and putting it together with programming. My name is Matt. I've worked as a software engineer for the past 14 years, and I also teach Python programming in both community and industry settings. And I also serve as a volunteer for the Python community here in the Philippines. And one of my proudest moments was being recognized as a PSF Fellow member. But most importantly, I fancy myself as a peanut butter and coffee enthusiast. Allow me to begin with a story about how I got into this whole space. Programming paved a path for me to explore and experiment on things that intrigued me. As a child, I liked learning about how things work, you know, taking things apart and trying to put them back together, sometimes successfully, most times not. But it gave me an odd sense of high. It also led me to a lot of bruises and trouble, but it was worth it. My first computer was the Atari 130XE. In the eyes of an 8-year-old, it was the most fascinating thing I have ever seen. The rest is history from there on. Programming enabled me to make my own tools and games and led me to learn all about operating systems, networking, and virtualization. I fell in love with Linux and Python in college, and I went crazy with the smallest Linux installations I could manage, like DSL or Damn Small Linux and Puppy Linux, and installed Python into almost any platform I had access to. This is a Python Tetris clone I made fairly recently and loaded it into a Nokia N-Gage. I first heard about consumer 3D printing in 2012. The idea of being able to see something designed from your computer come to life got me really excited. The Star Trek replicator is upon us. The possibilities made me feel like an 8 year old again. Alas, its availability and cost was out of my reach. I can only dream of having one someday. Then one day, during the pandemic, I thought I wanted to expand my hobbies into electronics and maybe build a UMPC with a Raspberry Pi. So I bought a Raspberry Pi and an electronics kit to start tinkering with. My tinkering led me once more to 3D printing and saw so a lot of neat Raspberry Pi projects done with it. I was also amazed at how accessible and affordable it has since become. Maybe it's time to get one. I'm married now, so I talked to my wife about it and tried to justify having a tool that can be used to repair most home stuff with 3D printing. Well, she's smart enough to see through my bullshit, but indulge me with no objections either. So wife approval, checked. This is my 3D printer and 
Since then, I went deep into the rabbit hole of slicers, STL files, bed leveling, print speed, and quality settings, filaments, more bed leveling, while mostly printing toys and accessories I found on Thingiverse. One day, my wife wanted to use a second monitor for work. I had an extra monitor at the office and thought she could use that. When the monitor arrived, it turns out that it does not have a standard VESA interface that we can use to attach to the monitor mount for her table. Yeah, those proprietary mount systems, ah, they suck. And so I search through Amazon and Lazada for a VESA adapter and found one, but the price is almost half the price of the monitor. So no thanks. I search through Thingiverse if someone has already designed a VESA adapter for the monitor. I found one, but upon printing it, the measurements were way off. Problem? Nay, opportunity. Prior to this, I already started tinkering a bit in Blender and FreeCAD for parametric modeling, but they felt clunky and overwhelming. So I searched for something more my element and found out about OpenSCAD in a Python library that interfaces with it called Solid Python. Three D modeling in Python. So, what is OpenSCAD? OpenSCAD is an open source script only CAD modeling software. It was developed back in two thousand and ten, and it utilizes this concept called constructive solid geometry or CSG modeling technique. And this is Solid Python. So Solid Python is an open source Python library that generates open SCAD code. It also allows you to tap into the power of Python and its ecosystem in when you're doing 3D modeling. Well, still, since Open SCAD has also a vast ecosystem in of itself, um, Solid Python still allows you to uh, utilize those uh, third-party libraries for OpenSCAD. Now here's the meat of the concept. Constructive solid geometry. So constructive solid geometry or CSG is the manipulation of basic shapes or what they call primitives through operations. Now these operations are either Boolean operations like creating a shape from the union of or difference of two shapes and also geometric operations like moving and rotating shapes in the 3d plane now let's see it in action you can install OpenSCAD via snap if you're on ubuntu you can run it uh, just by launching the uh, desktop icon or through the OpenSCAD command. And it's also, since it's cross-platform, so there are also binaries for other operating systems. Now, solid Python is just a simple pip install operation. The OpenSCAD interface uh, looks like this and it comes with its own text editor and the file extension is called SCAD for the open SCAD scripts. Now, this is just a boilerplate uh, that is good to build things on top of. Uh, it runs the Python SCAD translator and launches the open SCAD program with the generated SCAD file.
the hello world of 3D modeling. Well, I'm not sure. Uh, but the cube is a nice shape to start with. So all you need to do is to import the cube uh, function and it gives you, it, uh, you just feed it with a list or a tuple with three um, uh, with three values in it. So uh, it allows you to define the cube within the X, Y, and Z uh, plane. So that was how you create a primitive. In, this, in that case, uh, it's a cube. Now let's try adding some color. Now it's our first operation. And we, we import the color function for this one. Um, and then we just wrap it on top of the cube. Notice that the shape is wrapped inside the color operation once it's been translated back to scan. Now, there's a translate function that enables us to move the shape within the X, Y, and Z planes. From here, you'll notice that the Python code, uh, notice that in the Python code, each function returns a SCAD compatible object. And we just tend to use that as an input to the next function, resulting to this wrapping of primitives and operations once it's been translated. Now let's try another shape. The cylinder normally lays flat in the x-axis, but utilizing the rotate function, we can reorient it minus 90 degrees from the x-axis. Now the real magic starts once you start using simple shapes together to create something new. Here, we use the cylinder to punch through a hole into the cube by performing a difference operation between the two. All right, now that we know the basics, it's time to do what we came here for. Let's model the VES amount. Now the VES amount is split into two parts. Uh, the first part would be the monitor adapter and the VES amount in itself. Okay. So the monitor adapter is the one that we will, uh, is the one in the red color. Uh, it's the one that hooks uh, hooks in the latch beneath the monitor, and then the vessel mount is the one that we you know we attach to the vessel plate. Okay. And this is how it looks like once uh, it is attached. So the monitor adapter attaches to the latch in the bottom of the monitor here, uh, indicated by the red box, and while the VESA mount is screwed together with the VESA plate indicated by the blue box here. Now let's explore uh, the, uh, the, the creation of the monitor adapter shape. I'll spare you the boring details, but I've split each primary shape into their own function and created this adapter that matches the monitor's latch, uh, this particular shape here. Now, it took me several prints and measurement adjustments to get this part right. Uh, the technique was to only print the part that attaches to the latch before committing to the whole object uh, to save on filament. So this, this particular part, I had to do a lot of trial and error 
and once it has like hooked in uh, perfectly then I commit it towards you know, printing the whole shape. Now you'll also notice since this is a 3D print um, you also need to be creative with strengthening the design. So in this case I had to create this X, uh, X shape here just to add a bit more strength for uh, so, so that it would be able to carry the weight of the monitor. Now let's see, uh, let, now let's create and design the vessel mount itself. Uh, this shape is pretty much, it's more straightforward to design, but it taught me how to use the hull function which is used to fill out the space between two objects you want to put together. So this mount, uh, it actually uses two triangle shapes. So this is one triangle, this part here. And then there's a hidden triangle on this part here. Um, and then once you use the hull function between those two uh, rectangles, it created this uh, uh, it filled out the space between them through this slanting shape that you see here. Okay. And then I just uh, we j I just used uh, other shapes to uh, well the the same cylinder technique that we did to punch through the hole the holes that we have here. Now let's put the two shapes together, or the two main objects together. So this is what the whole product looks like uh, when, they, when they're combined. It was a little tricky to get the items aligned to ensure that the screw holes that go through them is still lined up properly. So yeah, I, I had a bit more trial and error on, this, uh, on these parts here. All right, now that everything looks like in order, let's print this thing. I printed the mount first and ran out of uh, filament on the last layer. It's almost finished and I ran out of filament here. Good thing though, uh, good thing that you can pause the print and attach another filament. Uh, that's all. Uh, so I also have a filament that's almost used up lying around. So I attach, I attach that, and it looks like this now. In hindsight, I accidentally experimented with this concept called multicolored printing in this way. Finally, I loaded uh, another roll of black filament and printed the adapter. Now. I think the whole thing, uh, the mount and the adapter, uh, took about eight to nine hours in total to print. Uh, I forgot, uh, but yeah, it's about that much time. So it takes a long time. And now for the moment of truth. I attach the adapter into the mount. You'll also notice that um, I strengthened the, uh, these latches uh, with super glue just to, um, I don't know, to, to make them last longer because I tend to uh, uh, take it up, uh, put it on and off of the monitor latch and that adds stress to the material. And it's a very thin um, strip of plastic here. And then, uh, and then the mount, I've screwed it into the VESA plate. Now, I've hooked it into the monitor. This is really starting to get very exciting at this point. And I've finally attached the whole thing into the monitor stand.
There's no greater feeling than seeing your creation come to life. Plus, the feeling of being cool in front of your wife. This is it. I can do anything. Until one of the latches that attaches to the monitor broke off. Nothing that a super glue won't fix. Um, until my wife tried it out and it was positioned too high. No problem. I haphazardly designed a patchwork extension to lower the position of the monitor. However, this just made the monitor start bending from the weight. I mean, start. I mean, the made the mount start bending from the weight of the monitor. I am so crushed at that point, um, and I thought I need to rethink this. So back to the drawing board. Much like programming, design is an iterative process. However, unlike programming, it's much more difficult to ascertain the effectiveness of your solution until you've printed and tested the design. And 3D printing, as you've noticed, takes a long time. So from here on, I've made more improvements to the design of the mount. I've made a longer mount board. Um, I've also uh, segmented screw holes to make it easier to adjust the positioning relative to the user's eye level. So um, I've also made it uh, Compatible with both 100 millimeter and 75 millimeter VESA mounts, if you notice here. Um, I've also improved the strength to handle the weight of the monitor by adding these fins at the back. I've also added some custom spacers. Um, in case the fins would obstruct the screw path of the mount into the VESA plate. So it took me a uh, few days to, to uh, play around with these designs and um, learn a lot about uh, uh, OpenSCAD's uh, different functionalities. Redemption. So finally, my wife's able now to use it. And I'm able to use it. And it's still a work in progress, but this has worked much better than before. And I'm glad to say it has survived rough handling and a few earthquakes without breaking a sweat. This project made me realize and appreciate how costly and time consuming the R&D work must have been in the things that we use in our daily lives, like the ergonomics of this mouse. This dual plug USB drive. And even this dual screen phone. As a programmer, it may be more conscientious in writing code that my teammate and future self would appreciate, and design solutions that will be more intuitive for my users. It also made me appreciate what 3D printing brings to a household. Manufacturer creates proprietary monitor mount that locks you into their ecosystem? No problem. Build an adapter yourself. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. That's it. If you have a 3D printer and have tried 3D modeling or haven't tried 3D modeling yet, go check out OpenSCAD and Solid Python. If anything, if anything else, 
I hope this encourages you to try new things and expand your skills. With the ever-growing accessibility of consumer 3D printing, your programming skills now enable you to become a maker of things too. Thanks for listening and catch me in any of these links and I'll see you around. See you next time. Uh, hi guys, we are with Matt now. Matt is software engineer and the president of the Python Philippine community and as a Python Software Foundation fellow too. Most importantly, he is a coffee and peanut butter enthusiast. Matt, thank you for joining me today on live Q&A. Your talk is about how Python supercharged your maker journey, right? Uh, yes, that's correct. Yeah. So how about your version adapter now? Is it on duty? Still on duty? Yeah, it still is. Um, wow. It's, <laughs> it's Amazing. Been, uh, I think it's been maybe like three, four months now since I've installed it wow. and it's still working. Yeah. And it yeah. has survived a few earthquakes too, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's great. It's still on duty. <laughs> okay, so I will start with question number one, Matt. What were some of the key findings or setbacks when you were exploring the framework of library you use? Uh, yeah, so the library that I'm using, uh, Solid Python, so it's, so, so, so the, the real 3D modeling software here is called OpenScan, and it has its own um, kind of like a scripting language. Uh, so Solid Python is an adapter for that. So it just converts whatever you coded in Python into OpenScan compatible code. Um, now what I've discovered there is that since it's just a translator, so it, it really just uh, gives, uh, it translates the, the it translates your Python code purely into OpenSCAD. Now, sometimes OpenSCAD, if you want to share your OpenSCAD scripts, you can create functions for it, define variables for it. Now, since Solid Python just translates to OpenSCAD, if you have variables, if you have functions in Python, those things don't get translated. So it's just something that uh, for for folks to keep in mind. If you plan to share the OpenSCAD generated um, scripts. Um, it's probably not going to be maintainable, but if you share your Python OpenSCAD scripts, maybe that's the way to go about it. Wow, thank you. So this question from Igor, uh, which filament do you use for adapter? Is it ABS? Uh, yeah, so I was like trying a few things. I was like thinking about this before and um, so, so so apparently, so sometimes I just kept on using PLA. Uh, it's the it's the most uh, basic and non, relatively non toxic type of material that you can use for three D printing. Um, the problem with ABS is uh, it it's a little bit more toxic if you print it. Like especially in my case, like I have a very small uh, small condo, so. Um, if unless you have like very good ventilation or it's like out of your bedroom, maybe ABS is okay. Uh, but you know, like for small spaces, PLA is the safest bet, um, and it's still relative. It's much stronger anyway. Like ABS is is a brittle plastic compared to PLA. Where if it the the thing with PLA, if you put a load like a uh, heavy load with it, instead of it breaking like suddenly it kind of like stretches first before. So, so, so you kind of like see if it's not going to work out. So, so before yeah. some, an accident happens, like, yeah. So, <laughs> so you see first, right? It's, it's yeah. going to fall down or not. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It, it will have to bend first and then, okay. At least okay. you get some assessment. Yeah. So. It's just like a red, right? One. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's true. Okay, so the next question, how do you do the strain and stress modeling for your monitor mount? Is the trial and error or the open sketch package can help that with that? Uh, so with the modeling, um, it, it, so what I realized uh, in, the, in the talk, I talked about it, like, um, so it's kind of like different. So, so 
OpenSCAD helps you with uh, um, wait. I for I, so so the way you would uh, the way you do the modeling, right? So you don't know exactly if the material will fit straight away. So OpenSCAD uh, measures uh, has its own measuring uh, system in units, so you don't know. So it doesn't really care like what you're measuring. A unit is is so whether you use millimeters, centimeters, or inches, it just uh, assigns a unit to it. Like so, it's just one. So uh, so 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 from zero point zero zero one to one two three. So it just depends now on your slicer, so with how it translates those units. So a slicer is another type of software, where so so with with OpenSCAD, uh, you generate. You can you will use it to generate a file called an STL file. So uh, this STL file is what the slicers use. Um, this is 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 what you load up to a slicer software. And then a slicer software is the one that translates the STL into an actual like measurable unit that a three D printer can print. So so there's like another intermediary software that that's needed. So, what what uh, during the process um, uh, when you when you create a model, you try it out, put in the measurement, load uh, and then um, load it up to OpenSCAD and then export an STL file, and then from the S from uh, with the STL file you put load it up to a slicer, and then print it. So that takes a little bit of a trial and error. Uh, I know the steps. There's like it sounds like there's like a lot of steps involved as well. So the, the, the technique there is just to uh, print. You can always like slice it on the slicer. Right? You can just like chop off the area that you just want to print out and test. So that's what I would suggest like, so, cause with a 3D printer, like it actually takes a long time to print. It's not like your, your 2D printer where like yeah. a few, few seconds and you have an object. No, it's not like yeah. that. So, it takes like a very long time <laughs> to to print. So I suggest like with the slicer, just chop off the part that you want to measure, um, and then you kind of like progress from there. Thank you, Matt. The next question: What is the library of existing Open OpenSCAD model like? Can you easily import them in and work with them in the solid Python? Can any existing three D printing uh -huh. model can be convert to OpenSCAD? Uh-huh. Okay, so so uh, the the great thing about OpenSCAD, it's already like a pretty much a very mature library and a lot of people have been contributing like shortcuts. So for example, if you want to create like screws, um, I, I 3D printed like um, screw threads and things like that. So people have been sharing their OpenSCAD libraries already. So it so it's just a matter of like importing the OpenSCAD library in OpenSCAD. Now the question is, can I use them in Python? So with Solid Python, um, you can import the those OpenSCAD libraries as well. So it provides a way for you to write like um, raw Solid Python scripts or import Solid Py uh, OpenSCAD libraries. So so yeah, so so you can do that as well. As far as um, as far as like, can you create like different types of models? Um, I've seen, I, I, I've, I, I've seen people like um, creating like really um, uh, compl complex uh, models in OpenSCAD for sure. Um, but you cannot create. I, I, I doubt. I, I don't think OpenSCAD would it, uh, would be a good way to like create like models like this one. So 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 maybe like a, a different three D modeling software uh, should be used for just maybe like blender or something but if you, you plan to yeah if you plan to create like um, functional objects maybe create something like uh, like gears or or like um, a casing for your drone things like that or a robot uh, you can create them in open sky I've, I've seen uh, people modeling using that that's cool. 
Okay, so the next question, how can we get started on 3D modeling or IoT? Do you have any basic baby step for those who are interested? Uh, hmm, step. So, so, so the way I did that, uh, so, so with 3D modeling, 3D printing, I suppose uh, to, to get started with, um, just try to print a lot of things that, that interest you to begin with, like, like really, really learn first your 3D printer. So, so, so I think 3D printer, 3D printing tech is really not plug and play at the moment. So it, it actually involves quite a lot of, um, uh, a deep dive in the rabbit hole of the whole like 3D printing space. Like, um, I spent a lot of time just playing around with different printing speeds, uh, techniques for leveling the bed because you need to like make sure that you have like a very flat surface for for printing um, otherwise you know you get the measurements wrong you get the oddly printed object <laughs> so so first study that learn it uh, print different types of shapes and then once you're once you feel comfortable that's when you i would suggest you start um, um, creating your own shapes uh, at least that's what I did in my case. So I started off um, printing very simple things first. I, I I started like just trying out like printing a spacer. So so one of the things uh, before an issue with with my chair is that um, I've lost one of the spacers, like those those little like donut like objects uh, that you put in between a screw. So yeah, that's yeah. a spacer. So I, I lost one of those, and what I did it was just I, I modeled a simple donut shape that uh, that converts into a spacer. I, I printed that, um, so that worked out okay. So that's very easy. And then, and then I started. Well, actually, from there, I actually jumped towards printing the uh, <laughs> the uh, the best amount. So. I experimented first with different objects. I copied, like, and I, I, what I did was that I took an, a natural open scan project, uh, and then I translated that into Python. That's how I learned properly. So, so yeah. So, so maybe like find an open scan project uh, that you saw that you like to print, convert that to Python using Solid Python, and then learn the ins and outs from there. Wow, very good answer. I love this question. What's the next household item you are going to design and print for your wife? <laughs> uh, yeah, I was. Uh, uh, I was. I was like, like I. What I. What I told her because she was into plants uh, before everything came in, and I was like, I was trying to convince her, like maybe I can like print her like a hydroponic project uh, so that's something that I'm always looking into uh, she she's not very like thrilled with the idea because she she's she'd rather like buy it from Shopee because <laughs> it's much quicker that way she tells me <laughs> but uh, <laughs> okay. um, but but yeah that's definitely something that I'm looking into maybe um, I, I saw a lot of like nice uh, hydroponic projects uh, that we can experiment with um, so that yeah, that's that's something that I will probably create for her next time. Uh, we've also started getting into um, um, crypto, Bitcoin. So I saw a project called uh, Seed Signer. You guys can check it out. Seed Signer. Uh, it, it, it's a it's a project that involves using a Raspberry Pi Zero and some 3D printing to print out a case for the Raspberry Pi Zero to turn it into a hardware cold storage wallet. So Oh, the uh, wallet. Yeah. Yeah, 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 for, yeah, for your cryptocurrency. So yeah. So that's also something that um, yeah, perhaps I'll be ex experimenting with. Yeah. So yeah, check it out, Seed Signer. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you. So what you have made with your 3D printing that you love most with Tish? Uh, well, for sure, the uh, the the best amount is something uh, that I'm very proud of because it yeah. like took me a lot of time to learn it. Um, yeah. Also, I have here like a few items here. Oh, can you show us? Wow, I, uh, I can't see it. Oh, it's maybe. Yeah, can it? 
thank you. <laughs> thank you, Matt. Yeah. So, so it, it printed this one. It was a weekend activity for me and my wife. Wow. So, so this it's one is. Professional. <laughs> wow. So this one is Grogu uh, yeah. or video that, and this one is um, Wolfgang from Animal Crossing. Uh, my wife. This is this is her favorite um, Animal yeah. Crossing villager. So I printed this one and then we painted it over the weekend. And I just realized it's a nice, um, it's a nice kind of like, it's, it was like the pandemic. So it was a nice, like, kind of like a different type of date activity. activity. Yeah, so it's so fun. Cute. <laughs> <laughs> so cute. It's look like you buy it from somewhere. It's look professional, you know. Oh, thank you. Oh, uh, the, 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 oh I saw. Yeah. Uh, a question for Igor here. Uh, he okay. asks what paint I used. Uh, it's just uh, any acrylic paint, uh, but you need to uh, spray paint it first with a, a layer paint. Um, any spray paint that is a matte and gray color. So, yeah. Okay. So I will move into the next questions. Uh, can you tell us more about constructive solid geometry? Sure. Um, so this is something that, uh, so, so, so this is like a different way of like thinking about creating objects, especially when you're creating them using programming, um, versus say a traditional modeling software where you just have shapes, you put them together and then you kind of, you know, with, with, with uh, the way you translated that into programming and the way I thought about it when I understood it that uh, you can think about um, construct uh, CSG or constructed solid geometry a, as a way of um, creating new shapes out of basic shapes. Okay. So you can think about it maybe like woodworking uh, where you have, imagine that like you have like a slab of or a block of wood where you chop it off until you get the desired shape. And then you take another shape, then chop it off and then you get the desired chip and you put them together. So you can think about CSG that way. So when you, when you, the way you think about it when you code it is that given I have a, a, a square shape, uh, but the difference with CSG though is that the way you chop things off is that you chop them off using another shape. So for example, uh, in, in my talk I showed there, uh, you have, say you want to create a box with a hole inside. So the way you do it is you create a box and then you create a cylinder shape. And then you just, uh, uh, you uh, you get the difference between the two shapes uh, with the box as your base shape or as the as your like, right hand um, num number or, or right hand object. Then you, uh, you use the cylinder as get the difference from between the two and then you have now a box with a hole in, in it so so yeah so thank you i a little bit love that answer it's so clear i can understand it easily okay oh, okay. Good. okay so the next question you as a leader of technology communities who strive to create an environment where balance can be achieved what you have done so far and how you will encourage others to prevent burnout situation? Yeah, so, I mean, as you, as, as, as you may have like noticed as well, like um, being a community volunteer, it's, um, it's different from, from being an attendee. Like um, yes. everyone started out as an attendee, then you get all these like nice, positive um, vibe, positive, uh, feelings but then once you started and that, that's why we went into volunteering that's that's also how i started uh, when i attended my first PyCon. um but then when you actually do the volunteer work it's different like it's actual work and you do it for free as well so so what we've noticed uh, uh usually um uh usually uh, you start with the 100 percent energy and then it just diminishes over time and it diminishes sometimes, you know, like life gets you or you're, or sometimes you feel like your level of commitment towards community work is not reciprocated by your co-volunteers. Mm -hmm. um, so at some point you just burn out, right? So something that we did uh, 
with Python PH is that uh, uh, we uh, we created programs within uh, the at least the ones who are uh, we, we call them like core volunteers, but basically they're, they're the ones that we recognize as somewhat more participative uh, people in terms of like contributing their time. So we call them, uh, we created this, uh, we, and, and everyone needs to have a feeling of like belonging towards something, right? So we created, we branded the core volunteers. We called it Kaizen. It's from the Japanese word Kaizen yeah. uh, with a D because um, I don't know. Like it's a it's a, de a Linux demonized um, process where it's just you know like a background process where it's some it's a it's it's like a way of improvement as 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 a way as a background process. It's, it's supposed to be a natural thing where you want to keep on improving. So yeah. we call it like Kaizen. This this small group that we have of core volunteers. And what we do there is that uh, we. Every year, we set a budget for team building. So we take everyone out, maybe in the beach, nice place where we just chill, hang out, maybe for a couple of nights. So everyone loved that, and everyone felt that, you know, like it kind of like enriches the feeling of camaraderie between each other. And we separated, we usually separate people in teams where a team is assigned to cook for breakfast and then the other team is assigned to cook for dinner. Yeah. And then we have a little bit of competitive activities between the teams and things like that. Yeah. Um, since the pandemic though, we only did online gatherings for, for, for as, a, as a way to compensate for that. Yeah. Um, and then recently at the start of the year, one thing, one thing that we've noticed, if you want people to step up, um, uh, you can't just leave them be. Like you can't just um, expect them to kind of like um, feel their way around uh, uh, in the leadership position. You need you need you need someone to guide them. Like really tell them to um, really tell them to embrace the role that they're into. Uh, uh, otherwise, they'll just be passive about it. So what we did uh, is we started doing coaching sessions. Uh, uh, me as the president of the org and, and Miki as well. So uh, as the director of operations, so we decided that uh, we kind of like split the the officers. So, so usually I, I've 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 coached the the guys and then Miki coached the the girls in the in the in the uh, in the office with the officers. So so yeah, it's a. a Initially, it was more like a formalized coaching session kind of thing, where where we tried to analyze their where, where we basically the idea was, was that uh, their community work has to align with whatever goals that they have as well, whether it be professional or personal. So the way to sustain their energy towards um, contributing to the community is that if everyone feels that whatever they do in the, with the community aligns with the rest of their lives. So that's that was the, what the coaching session was about. Um, and that's what we helped them with. Um, eventually, it kind of like um, progressed towards instead of more of like a coach, coachy relationship, it eventually turned into more of an accountability partner relationship between us. So I think everyone in the officer group, after, after we did that, we did notice that they kind of like felt more um, engaged uh, and more sustainable. And I think they, so far, the, the, the reaction was like, it's a positive one. Uh, so yeah, we just plan on keep doing something like that. Yeah, uh, that's very great, I think. Like you have a community, like being together, stuff like that. Okay, so the next question. Uh, most of us are, this week are coming to learn, experiment, and try new thing ourselves. But what kind of advice do you give to a new student in Python? Um, okay, so, so, so Python is actually a perfect place for for that. So there's a lot of talks here, a lot of workshops, and perhaps, uh, and and this is also a the perfect place where you can kind of like discover things that you have never heard of that Python can do. Uh, and perhaps also there's been something that you've heard, but you've just been putting off. 
most likely there's a talk already here for that. So I suggest uh, to those who are listening uh, to to watch those sessions, uh, get inspired, just and then just start small. Maybe spend the next couple of weekends um, trying things out. Um, so yeah, I mean that's yeah that's that's how that's how I started as well. So. Okay, so this is the last question. Was it, what is your lesson learned about your maker journey? Um, so with, uh, with my maker journey, uh, I've, I've learned that uh, uh, there's like life itself. It's like, it's, it's full of fascinating things to learn and explore. And what I've learned when I was like um, um, exploring the space of electronics and 3D printing mm -hmm. was that it, gave me a different perspective of the world. And it also uh, gave me a different also way of looking at problems uh, that I can kind of like correlate with my work as an engineer. So yeah, definitely like try something out, even if it doesn't seemingly involve programming, it actually expands your mind towards, you know, like thinking and looking at things in, in, in more creative ways, which you can apply that work. That's cool. Oh, uh, Matt, we have one more question from Dylan. How do you find a successor to lead? Oh, it's a good question. Uh, yeah, so so the way we do it here, I mean, the, so the the so I've been with Python Peach like for like a long time, and the people that started it with us like back in two thousand and. 13 are no longer with us. I think out of the eight original, uh, out of the ori eight original uh, core officers, there's like three of us left, me, Mickey, and Sony. Um, and then the rest kind of like moved on with their lives. So right now we're back at seven. <clears throat> we call them the, the, new, <clears throat> the new generation of leaders. So <clears throat> uh, there's a bit of a, uh, uh, they, they're, they're basically just the ones you, you like Py, organizing PyCon is the best place to to actually um, see people who have the potential to to kind of like lead um, it's, it's, this is usually the place where <clears throat> where people shine actually where the volunteers shine you you will just see people like taking charge and then you'll notice them so that's how that's how we and then once when you find them, Make sure that you take care of them and, and, and really nourish these people. And that's how we found our, our next set of officers, basically. So the ones that we have here, Ange, Zorex, uh, um, those two, like they're the ones who, st who stepped up. And, um, and yeah, when, when we found them, we just nourished them. <laughs> Yeah, that's cool. So, attendee, if you guys want to chat with Matt, you can like raise your hand and just like pop in and talk to Matt right now. So, yeah. by the way, Matt, yeah, uh, wait, while we're waiting for the raising hand, Matt, where well, can we follow you and your amazing work? Um, sure, sure. Um, check me out at uh, on Twitter. I've I've already recently like kind of like toned down on Facebook. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, so, so on Twitter, my ha I'll, I'll type in my handle. Okay. Yeah. So he'll leave the information in the box. Yeah. So, so um, uh, you can find me on LinkedIn, Twitter, and GitHub. So I use the same um, handle. It's Creative Codesmith with an eight. Um, so yeah. You will got you will get one more follower for me every platform you use. Thank you. <laughs> I'm your big fan now. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll see you around then. <laughs> um, uh, okay. I'll, I'll also be hanging out in the Tagalog uh, ses uh, live session yeah. Uh, yeah. later this afternoon. Uh, yeah. it, it's actually not Tagalog anymore. It's like Taglish. So people can just hop, hop in there, uh, talk you, to us. And then, yeah. yeah. Do you guys have an open mic again? Like, can we... Go in and like <laughs> listen to the great music like that. I don't know. You'll have to ask Zorix and Edge for that. <laughs> okay. So okay, that's it, Matt. Uh, thank you so much, and for everyone, enjoy the race of the conference, everybody.
Thank you again, Matt. It's a yeah. very great session. Uh, I think we just like over time for like 15 minutes, but I love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we do. I love talking with you. Yeah. Welcome. Thank you. It's, it's a pleasure as well. Okay. So yeah. I think we like have to go now. Okay. Bye, everyone. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you. Thank you, every spectators.